tonight on NJ Spotlight News. A deadly 2018 accident in Bogota involving the wife of embattled Senator Robert Menendez is now under investigation by the state's attorney general's office. They were making her comfortable. It, it was crazy. Well, I think um, she had special treatment. Plus, nine weeks and counting, striking RWJ nurses meet again with federal mediators, hoping to secure safe staffing levels as the strike reaches day 64. We want to move forward. We want to go back to work and we want a contract today. Also, evictions on the rise. New research by Rutgers and Princeton uncovers households facing the greatest rate of evictions have children. That about 7.6 million people are threatened with eviction each year, 40% uh, of whom are children. And for World Homeless Day, haircuts, health checks, and help finding jobs for those experiencing homelessness in Newark. Haircuts, mobile showers, everything that we can do to help our people move their lives forward. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Friday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Indicted U.S. Senator Bob Menendez and his wife are facing new scrutiny tonight as the New Jersey Attorney General's office opens an inquiry into Nadine Menendez's fatal 2018 car crash. State officials reportedly seized records Thursday from Bergen County law enforcement agencies, that's where the crash occurred, to review whether the investigation was handled properly. Newly revealed police records first reported by the Bergen record detail an accident where Menendez then girlfriend struck and killed a pedestrian along a main road in Bogota. She was then released by police found not at fault without a summons or a sobriety test. The accident was mentioned in the indictment against Menendez, his wife and three New Jersey businessmen as the reason behind the bribe to give the couple a new Mercedes Benz in exchange for political favors. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. On East Main in Bogota, surveillance cameras catch a black Mercedes as it hits and kills a pedestrian getting out of a car and attempting to cross the street. The bend stops. The driver, Nadine Arslanian, was dating Jersey's senior senator, Bob Menendez. But nobody knew on that December night, almost five years ago, that the couple would later marry and eventually face charges of bribery, fraud, and extortion. Back then, police questioned Arslanian, who refused to surrender her cell phone. I just want to confirm that you do not want to give me your phone, correct? Yes. Okay. And that's your statement that you were driving this way, the guy came from this way, and he ran into your vehicle? He jumped on my windshield. Yeah. Okay. The man killed was Rich Coop, and his body blew a hole in Arslanian's car windshield. According to the recent federal indictment, she sent multiple text messages to one of the co-defendants about her lack of a car. Three months later, Arslanian got a brand new Benz worth $60,000, the recent indictment charges, as a bribe. In return for Senator Menendez trying to disrupt a state criminal investigation by New Jersey's Attorney General's office. Now the AG's re-examining those events, including the accident. Details are emerging after years of questions. I, I was so obsessed with it for, for days and days and days kept Googling and the accident, nothing, nothing. Coop's friend, Michelle Mayo, owns the Cozy Tavern and had set up a collection box for his family. Coop was popular around town, a divorced dad with a teenage son. He loved sports and playing darts. Both the tavern and Vitaly's restaurant put up plaques in his memory. He was a great guy. Everybody misses him. It's just a shame how it happened. His life was taken away. But they're also angry over what they see on the police body cam. If we can clear you from any wrongdoing, I want to get you home and comfortable 
and not here anymore. And watching the video, it just feels like it's not fair the way she just, the lady just walked away and just basically said, go home and get comfortable. You know, it's just, that's what gets me sad. She was treated like a queen. Police didn't test her for drugs or alcohol, and their reports determined that Miss Arslanian was not at fault in this crash. Mr. Coop was jaywalking and did not cross the street at an intersection or in a marked crosswalk. Legal experts say it's not unusual for police to forego a breathalyzer test if there's no obvious impairment. Coop's friends want it looked into. It's not going to bring back rich but but it will be justice will be done for him the new york post today reported that after the accident a retired chief of detectives from the bergen county prosecutor's office arrived to escort arslanian home senator menendez when asked about the incident told reporters that was a tragic accident and uh, uh, obviously uh, we think of the family Friends and family of Rich Coop are also thinking about getting to the truth. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. The striking nurses union at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick today met with a federal mediator. It's the second mediated negotiation session since the strike began on August 4th. And so far, the meetings have yet to produce a contract that nurses say meet their requests, including a safe staffing ratio. Ted Goldberg has the latest from the picket line. What do we want? Safe when do we want it? Now! When do we want a contract? The nurses union at RWJ couldn't agree on a contract with management after six hours of meeting with a federal mediator today. Their strike now stands at 64 days. We want to move forward. We want to go back to work and we want a contract today. We put our families in the middle of this. We put our loved ones, our friends, we put our own finances, our own mental health well-being. And this is not a decision we made lightly. It is not a vacation despite what all of the executives and Robert Wood Johnson kept saying. RWJ Barnabas, an underwriter for NJ Spotlight, has used replacement nurses over the last two months to cover the 1,700 nurses that are on strike. The union says those replacement nurses are earning as much as four times what union nurses make. If they would have used the $7,200 a week that they're spending on these scab nurses and invested it in the nurses that have been here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 plus years, you will attract so many nurses across the state. There is no price tag on the kind of care that I've seen these nurses, my coworkers give to their patients. The difference between having a positive experience in a hospital and a negative one will have resounding effects on that entire patient's life and their families. When did hospitals start worrying about uh, more more on, on the money than on patients. The biggest issue behind this strike is staffing levels. RWJ says those levels for nurses are sufficient, while the nurses themselves disagree. Multiple studies have demonstrated that the mortality rate of patients go up 7% for each additional patient that is added to the average nurse's workload. You don't have enough time to assess the patients and make sure that they are safe. In response to this story, RWJ sent a statement that reads in part, the union seems to forget that it made the decision to go out on strike despite the hospital's requests that the parties continue to negotiate. Staffing at RWJ University Hospital is not just proper, but among the highest in New Jersey. In fact, the hospital is staffed by 170 more nurses than is called for in the recently proposed staffing legislation in Trenton that the union claims to support. The strike has lasted nine weeks because the union wants more than any healthcare organization would ever agree to. It's not important just for us as nurses, it's important for the community. It's important for our families. It's important for the future of nursing. I hope that the people inside realize that we're out here fighting for safe staffing and that we are united and we will continue to fight until we get this fair contract and safe staffing. Yeah. Yes. The union and management also met for six hours a few weeks ago. That last session produced two offers from RWJ, which were rejected by the union, continuing a strike that began in early August. 
In Islin, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. New research sheds light on the people most at risk of being evicted from their homes in the U.S., and the findings are startling. Children under the age of five make up the largest group of those whose households have had an eviction filed in the last year, and the racial disparities are worse. About a quarter of black babies and toddlers in rental households face the threat of eviction, forcing them to endure instability during the most critical years of their development. The research comes from a collaboration between Princeton and Rutgers University, along with the U.S. Census Bureau. It demonstrates that not only does the average evicted household include one child, but that the most common age to experience such a traumatic event is during the earliest years of a child's life. For more on the report, I'm joined by Nick Gretz. He led the collaboration for the Princeton Eviction Lab. Nick, thanks so much for joining me. Up until now, we have known very little about the individuals and the families who have faced eviction. The research you helped lead really uh, connected the dots there. And what did you find? Yeah, so this study is motivated by the fact that we've never truly known who gets evicted nationwide. Um, we com you know, we've compiled eviction court records across the country to try to track how many evictions happen. Um, but these court records just list the names uh, and addresses of tenants filed against. So they don't tell you anything about who these people are. Uh, we don't know their race, their age, or who else is living in those homes. Uh, for example, children are typically invisible in the legal documents that track eviction cases uh, and that only name adults uh, and leaseholders who are actually summoned to court. So through our partnership with the Census Bureau, we've linked eviction records to census data to finally uh, understand who's actually at risk of eviction in America. And, and so yeah, I mean, I, what you found was really stunning because having children didn't, in fact, shield you from eviction, but it exposes families. Right. So we found that eviction overwhelmingly affects households uh, that have children present. Um, we found that about 7.6 million people are threatened with eviction each year, 40% uh, of whom are children. Uh, and we actually found that the most common age uh, across the life to experience eviction in America is during childhood. So we're talking about the very youngest, the most vulnerable, babies and toddlers. What do we know about the long-term consequences when children as young as that and their families uh, face displacement? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of reasons to think this causes a lot of issues across you know, the life as those children are going to age. Um, experience eviction has a lot of material consequences for children, uh, including how their family acts as future housing and something like food security. Uh, having an eviction filing on your record makes it a lot harder for those families to find new housing, um, especially because families have constrained housing choices given that most affordable units are not large enough to comfortably house children. And then also schools are required by federal law to identify and provide resources to homeless children, for example, but low-income children have really little formal support. So previous research found, um, you know, about 1.3 million homeless children each year enrolled in public schools, but we found over twice that uh, amount are exposed to eviction each year. Uh, so we know this is going to have compounding effects on things like health and stress and cognitive development for these really young kids. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that certainly makes sense. What are the reasons beyond what you've just cited, which sounded like affordable housing and obviously some extra financial burdens, um, burdens, you know, take that how you will, uh, for families that they're facing this more because of the fact that they have young children? Yeah, so it's tough. I mean, almost all eviction filings are for non-payment of rent. Uh, and we know families are especially squeezed with housing costs and at particularly high risk of severe rent burden and falling behind on rent. Uh, and landlords often won't say they're evicting a renter because of children, um, but when tenants fall behind on rent, it leaves them vulnerable to landlords really deciding who to be more or less lenient with. Um, so, so that's, I think families are particularly exposed in that way of already being really squeezed up against that cost burden every month. Nick Gratz is a research associate with the Princeton Eviction Lab. Nick, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. There's new federal action being taken tonight against what are known as crisis pregnancy centers. Critics have long argued the facilities use deceptive marketing tactics, allegedly misleading patients by posing as abortion care providers, but backing anti-abortion policies. 
The resource centers deny those claims, but as senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, Representative Josh Gottheimer is now calling for the clinics to be shut down. The White House Pregnancy Resource Center, so-called, behind us, it appears harmless. But it's actually one of many deceptive brainwashing cult clinics across our state and country known as crisis pregnancy centers. Congressman Josh Gottheimer held a press conference today to blast the practices of crisis pregnancy centers, or CPCs, that advertise as a resource for pregnant women in crisis and where some women think they can turn for an abortion. But critics say they don't offer the help they promise. These centers masquerade as clinics and guidance centers who supposedly provide unbiased information to women in crisis. But these centers are largely run by evangelical groups who operate on the principle that women are just baby-making machines and that fetal rights trump women's rights every time. In January, New Jersey Attorney General Matt Platkin issued a consumer alert about CPCs, warning they do not provide abortion care. CPCs are organizations that seek to prevent people from accessing comprehensive reproductive health care, including abortion care and contraception, sometimes by providing false or misleading information. I went on the website for this place and it says abortion is a highly dangerous procedure untrue and very scary to read. Attorneys representing several crisis pregnancy centers around the state have sent a request to the attorney general asking for proof of deception. They say that's not what happens here. At Lighthouse, we think that life is a good choice. Um, we don't provide a refer for abortion and that we make that known on our website. We make that known when someone calls, but we are here to provide abortion information in a neutral atmosphere where no one profits from a person's decision. Lighthouse executive Director Debbie Provencher pushed back when Gottheimer announced they don't have medical professionals on staff. I know for a fact that Lighthouse has nurses and sonographers registered on the state site and that there are doctors overseeing the services. That's not at all the facts that I've held and we've done a lot of investigation on this. As for whether they tell women abortion is dangerous? Certainly dangerous to the unborn child. <laughs> so there is a danger to the procedure. Um, and then I know there are women that have been harmed by abortion. We don't emphasize that fact to women. We just, we want them to know, you know, there's potential physical, emotional, spiritual risks. Gottheimer is leading the Stop Anti-Abortion Disinformation Act in the House. Our legislation directs the Federal Trade Commission to prohibit myths and disinformation related to abortion services and authorizes the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, mission to penalize organizations that break this rule. He's also calling on the state to act and to shut down these 50 plus centers. By restricting crisis pregnancy centers deceptive marketing practices and to support state legislation to outlaw this type of advertising that masquerades as health care. He sent that request to Governor Murphy this morning. In Hackensack, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Several Jersey Shore towns are still reeling from the heavy rain and flooding that hit last weekend. Congressman Frank Pallone today surveyed the storm damage in Monmouth County, making stops in Asbury Park and Union Beach. Rain caused the Wesley Lake and Asbury Park to flood, sending the storm surge straight into the basements of businesses and homes, causing millions of dollars worth of damage. Pallone says in his 35 years in office, he's never seen a simple rain event cause this tiny of damage in the area. Well, he toured Union Beach with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to look at ongoing construction of flood control projects worth nearly a billion dollars. It includes new seawalls and dunes. Scientists say climate change will continue making storms stronger and their effects more severe. With climate change, small storms essentially accumulate and they become larger storms. And then larger storms become huge storms and huge storms become horrific storms, right? So, I mean, we can't, we can't ignore the fact that with climate change, we are going to see more frequent and more severe storms. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're doing this tour today, because, you know, we want to see what the impact of that is and what the future might be and what other projects might have to be done in the future. 
In our Spotlight on Business report, the U.S. job market is coming in hot. Employers added 336,000 jobs in September, according to the Labor Department. That's nearly double what economists expected and the strongest gain since January. It's another sign the labor market is still gaining momentum despite the higher interest rates. And it might be a little too much momentum for the folks over at the Federal Reserve. Analysts today said they expect the new employment numbers will keep the door open for another rate hike this year. The report suggests the economy gained momentum during the summer, fueled by strong consumer spending. It also showed the number of layoffs and people quitting their jobs remained effectively unchanged since July. Experts say that's an indicator of workers' confidence they'll land another position. Turning to Wall Street, stocks rallied following the better-than-expected labor data. Here's how the markets closed to end the week. And be sure to tune in this weekend to NJ BizBeat with Raven Santana. She surveys the landscape of higher education in New Jersey, from financial struggles for our institutions to unique workforce training programs and the latest effort to wipe away student loan debt. Watch it at 5 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday morning at 10 a.m. on NJPBS. Finally tonight, bringing focus to the issues of homelessness and inadequate housing. Newark Emergency Services for Families today held its fourth annual World Homeless Day, providing everything from haircuts and showers to shelter placement and medical screenings. As Melissa Rose Cooper reports, homelessness was on the rise during the pandemic, but has swelled since pandemic relief aid dried up. It's food, clothing, shelter, employment, education services, mental health, medical screening, substance abuse, everything that you could possibly think of. Just some of the everyday necessities Amina Bay of Newark Emergency Services for Families says every resident deserves. The need is continuing to grow. Um, a lot of people think that the need would lessen because the quote unquote pandemic was over, but it's still the emergency all the, did, the pandemic did was highlight uh, a need that was already there. Um, struggle that already existed and the numbers continue to rise our numbers continue to rise our numbers have quadrupled in our agency our homeless drop-in center um, uh, for employment services um, housing assistance rental assistance all of those numbers have quadrupled over the past few years that's why Bay says this World Homeless Day event is so important now in its fourth year dozens of agencies around the state gathered at Lincoln Park in Newark providing assistance to more than 600 people today. And then we give out things such as soap and uh, shampoo, washcloths, whatever. But I think one of the biggest things is they're really glad to have somebody to talk to and listen to their story, Father. Wendy Hurling is a senior case manager at St. James Social Services Corporation. She has been participating in the World Homeless Day event since it started. It seems like uh, after COVID, things got worse again. Uh, they were on their way to being up, but the numbers were lower, then COVID hit, and it just attacked people. So folks without addresses really had a hard time, really had a hard time. So being here, we can reach out to folks. Some people don't even know about us. Some people don't even know about NESF. So it's a blessing to be here again. People call them homeless. We call them our neighbors without addresses. Satiga Williams is also a returning participant, providing residents the information they need to stay healthy. So many people are suffering because they need help with prescription drugs, anxiety medicine, mental health services, and just preventive care. So it's very important to be on site, on the ground, boots on the ground, doing hands-on work, getting people the covers that they need. Haircuts, mobile showers, everything that we can do to help our people move their lives forward. All the resources available are made possible purely through donations. Generosity that needs to continue so more families can get closer to the goal of having somewhere to call home. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. 
And a reminder this weekend, be sure to tune into Reporters Roundtable as David Cruz talks to Republican State Senator Anthony Bucco about why the GOP caucus is calling for hearings into Senator Bob Menendez's dealings with the New Jersey Attorney General's office. That's Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10. Then on Chatbox, David has an extended interview with Congressman Josh Gottheimer on what a paralyzed house means for the future of a government shutdown, funding for Ukraine and, of course, the Senator Menendez indictment. That's Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. on NJPBS. That's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. Have a great weekend. We'll see you right back here on Monday. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSEG Foundation. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.